So today we're going to be converting fissure diagrams into Haworth projections. Um, it is expected that you're able to convert fissure into Haworth, Haworth into chair conformations, and then vice versa throughout. So we're going to start off with this fissure. Um, it is the sugar galactose, and the directions are to convert the fissure projection into a beta D galactopyranose. So there's a couple things you need to know before you start drawing the Haworth projector projection. The first thing is to understand how many membered or how many uh, carbons and oxygens are going to be inside the ring. And that's going to be determined by this pyranose. And so the pyranose tells you that you're going to be having a six membered ring. In contrast, you could have a furanose. And a furanose would tell you that you would be having a six membered ring. Sorry. Furanos is going to be telling you that you have a five membered ring. And another thing is to find out whether the fissure projection you're given in given is in the D or the L form. Remember, the way to figure that out is you find the most oxidized carbon, which is going to be the carbon that is double bonded to O, and you find the furthest stereo center away from it. So the first stereo center would be this one, second one would be below it, third one would be below it, then you have the fourth one. If we go one under, this guy is, this carbon is not a chiral center because it's connected to two hydrogens. So the furthest stereo center would be that carbon right there. And then if the OH is on the right, that's going to tell you it's a D sugar. And if it, the OH is on the left, it's going to tell you it's an L sugar. So the way I kind of remember this, if it's on the left, then it's L. The L and the L go in hand. And if it's not on the left, then it's going to be a D sugar because it's on the right side. And so this fissure projection has been always already given to us in the D form, so we don't need to worry about that. And the other thing is to figure out if it's in the beta or the alpha. And so the key thing to remember is your fissure projection does not tell you anything about it being alpha or beta. Alpha, beta are notations that are given to a particular sugar after they have cyclized, which will be in this Haworth projection and the chair conformation. So we know it's going to be a six-membered ring, so I'm going to start off with my traditional six-membered six ring with the oxygen in the upper right-hand corner. And then I'm going to start numbering my carbons. Um, if you're already good at this, you don't need to number it, but to show you where all the substituents are going, um, I will go ahead and number it. And so. Six, five, four, three, two, and one. Remember the oxygen is part of the ring, but I'm not numbering the oxygen. So if I number this on here, five, four, three, two, and one. Because it's going to be a six-membered ring, if you count out the carbons and the oxygen, it's going to be this hydroxyl group that's going to attack the carbonyl compound. So if we count it out, oxygen would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's your six-membered ring. And so now it's going to be drawing in the substituents. So the way to determine or to tell on your Haworth if it's a D or an L sugar is based off of the substituent on carbon number 5. If the substituent on carbon number 5 is going up, then regardless of where all the other substituents are going, you know it's going to be a D sugar. If the substituent on carbon number 5 is going down, then it's going to be an L sugar. And since we've already determined that this galactose fissure is given to you in the D, we're going to draw our substituent going up. And the substituent is going to be our CH2OH. Then we're going to go to carbon number 4. And so in carbon number 4, since we don't really have a CH2OH or anything to work with, the way we determine the positioning of these groups is based off on which side they are on the fissure. So if the hydroxyl group is on the left side, of the fissure, then it's going to be going up on the Haworth. If the OH is going on the right side of the fissure, then it's going to be going down on your Haworth. So in carbon number four, we have an OH that's going up, sorry, an OH that's on your left side, and as a result, that OH is going to be going up on your Haworth. On carbon number three, we have an OH that's on the left side. Again, left side means it's going to go up on the Haworth. Carbon number two, we have an OH that's on the right side. OH is going to be going down. And then we're resulted with carbon number one. So carbon number one is going to be your anomeric carbon. 
And the reason it's anomeric is because in the fissure, that carbon has an sp2 hybridization. And so if I draw in its empty p orbital, I should do it with a different color. The OH that is attacking that carbon can attack from the top or the bottom. And because it can attack from the top or the bottom, we get both isomers formed in our Hallworth. So we really don't know which way the OH is going to be going on carbon number one. We know it's going to be both. One might be more stable than the other, but do realize both products are formed because you're going from an sp2 into an sp3 hybridization that's giving it some stereochemistry. Because, so I will put OH on this one going up, and then I will also draw the second product in contrast to show you that it can also be going down. And again, this is only for the anomeric carbon. All the other substituents are defined in their particular stereochemistry. So our anomeric carbon is right there. The anomeric carbon goes from an sp2 to an sp3. Hence, we'll be go get both the up and the down on that particular carbon. And so the one that decide that it's for the answer is going to be based off of which one is beta. And so alpha beta is a relationship that is given to you based off of the substituents on carbon number one and carbon number five. And so if we're doing alpha beta, it's based off the substituents on C1 and C5. And so if the substituents on C1 and C5 are going in the same direction, or if they're going in the cis form, then the relationship is going to be beta. If the substituents on carbon number 1 and carbon number 5 are going in opposite directions, or trans, then that's going to give it the alpha notion. And so the way I kind of remember this is the opposite. I kind of replace the O with an alpha. And so opposite tells me that it's alpha. And if it's not going in the opposite direction, then it's going to be in the same direction, which is going to be beta. And since the problem tells you to pick the beta version, you're going to find the one that has carbon number 1 and carbon number 5 substituents in the same direction, which is going to be this one right here. So again, to recap, when you're converting from a Fisher to a Haworth projection, the substituent on carbon number 5 is going to tell you whether it's a D or L. Since our fissure was given to us in the D form, both our Hallworths should be in the D, hence why the substituent on carbon number 5 is going up. And then the substituents above it, carbon number 4, 3, and 2, if it's on the left side, then it's going to be going up. And if it's on the right side of the fissure, then it's going to be going down. And so then you're left with your last carbon, carbon number 1, also known as the anomeric, because you're going from an sp2 to an sp3 hybridization. You don't know which way the OH is going. It can attack from the top of that orbital or the bottom. And so you get both products formed. Um, and that's what's going to give you the alpha or the beta notion. In this case, this was our beta. And the one below is going to be the alpha. One Haworth might be more stable than the other, but do realize both are formed because of the sp2 to sp3 change on that anomeric.